How should we look at those years yet to come, the emptiness syndrome, which will surely come one day? Well, in Psalm 128, verse 4, Solomon uses the word we've seen over and over again five different times, and it's the word blessed. That means that God will bless every stage of family life, but even this stage, the emptiness syndrome, it ought to be a blessed time in your family, in your marriage, and in my family. Now, the obvious question is this. How can we prepare for those future years? And they are coming. They're coming like a freight train. How can we prepare for those future empty nest years and be assured that they're going to be blessed, that they're going to be happy, like Psalm 128, verse 4 talks about? Let me give you two suggestions, okay, from Uncle Buddy. Number one, prepare for release. Prepare for release. God wants children to grow up in good, godly homes. That's always been his plan. That was his plan back in the day with Solomon. And in modern family, it's still his plan. He wants his children to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He wants children to be raised in good and godly homes. But at the same time, at the same time, he wants us to eventually release them into the world, to send them out of the nest that we call home. We need to recognize that we need to prepare as parents for the release of our children. Now, in today's world, there's a relatively new phenomenon, and it's called boomerang kids. This is where a child grows up, you launch them out, they go for a little while, and then they boomerang and come back home again. That's a common experience. Some of you giggled because you've had that experience at your house, apparently, and it does happen more and more. And because of the economy... That's made this even more common because jobs are lost, the economy's bad, the hours are cut back, there's not enough paycheck. And because that sometimes our kids who have left and they've left the empty nest behind have to come back to the nest all over again. Or maybe it's a marriage that goes south and all of a sudden your son or daughter has to come back home again, come back to the nest. It happens over and over again. And I've got to tell you, I'm not against that. I don't think that's necessarily wrong for those kids to come back when there's a need. The other night, my daughter called me. It was a Sunday night. It was one of those 15-degree nights. Remember those that we've had so much of? About 14, 15 degrees. And she said, Dad, our furnace is out. Now, she lives almost in South Carolina. You know what Dad said? Come on home, sweetheart. <laughs> I'll yank out another blanket. We'll turn that thermostat up to 64. We're going to warm this place up for you. I am frugal. <laughs> Amen? And I welcomed her back. Bring the grandkids, by the way, when you come. I put that footnote on there. But I welcome her back. And there's nothing wrong with this as long as it's 30 days or less. <laughs> nothing wrong with it. Here's why I say that. This is not God's ideal will for children to be launched and then come back and stay permanently that's just not God's will when kids reach a certain age they need to be on their own and not only do they need to be on their own they want to be on their own they're adults now they need to make their own way in life they need to formulate their own life and their own family make their own decisions and I can promise you this even if they do come back and they're an adult it's not going to be like they were when they were eight or nine years old it's not going to be the same when April came home my daughter she didn't drag out her Barbie house she didn't say, now, where's Ken? I can't find him. When you need him, you can't find him anywhere. She didn't yank out the Barbie Corvette. It wasn't the same as eight or nine years old. It was different because they're different. Now they're full-grown adults, and I promise you there are challenges. If you've got more than one family living under your roof, you're going to have challenges. I'm not saying it's bad, but you're going to have some issues because you've got a lot of adults. You've got people with their own mindset you got people with their own agendas. you got people making their own decisions. And it can really be a challenge for you. So here's what we need to do. Raise our children knowing that one day we're going to have to release them. We're going to have to let them go and leave the empty nest behind. That's why I believe Solomon compares children to arrows. He says, like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior are these children that are heritages from the Lord and rewards from God. And he talks about that quiver thing. That's where you put the arrows. Now, I'm not much of an archer, but I know that when I was in college, archery was a P.E. elective. It was an easy A, I thought. But I learned a little bit about archery. Here's what I learned about it. First of all, you put the arrow on the bow. You put it on the string, and then you pull the string back. 
But you don't pull too hard because if you pull too hard on the string and put too much pressure, it'll break the string. And there I'll go right down to the ground. And then if you don't put enough pressure on that string and pull that arrow far enough back, it's going to be a sloppy joe. I mean, this is going to sloppy, fall on the ground, and not have any motivation, no power to go anywhere. So you've got to put just the right amount of pressure on that string, on that arrow, on that bow. Now, I believe that Solomon knew what he was talking about when the Holy Spirit inspired him to compare children to arrows. I believe that pressure on the string reminds us of discipline. We need discipline in our homes, amen? But I want to tell you something. If you put too much discipline, if you're too strict, if you're too authoritative, if you're too harsh, I want you to understand something. You can break their spirit. You can break that string of their spirit. And I want you to understand that will do irreparable damage to the children. But at the same time, we don't want to put too little pressure on that arrow because if we do, it's going to be a sloppy joke. It's not going to go anywhere. Second thing I learned about archery was this. There's always a target. That bullseye that's out there, you want to shoot for the target. What's the target in parenting? I believe the target in parenting is Proverbs 22, 7. Raise up a child in the way that he should go, not the way that I want to impose on him, not the way that I think he should go or she should go, but the way that God custom designed them to go. Point them toward the target of being all that God created them to be. And then at the right moment, you've got to release them and let them go toward that target. An arrow was not made to stay on the bow. And children were not made to stay in the home forever and forever. 30 days or less. That's my policy. I want you to understand that. Because we need to release them into the world. And that means that we've got an empty nest when that takes place. So I would say prepare for release. Be aware that that day is coming. And there's going to come a time when you have to stir the nest. And take those little eaglets and kind of push them over the side. Gently, in the love of Jesus, but nonetheless, an empty nest. Here's the second piece of advice. Prepare for romance. I like this one. Prepare for romance. As the kids are growing up in the home, and I've seen this happen over and over again. It's even happened in my marriage occasionally. We are so concentrated on those kids. We're so focused on raising them and keeping them in shoes and clothes and all the other details and school and homework and computers and the whole nine yards in modern family. And we're so preoccupied that sometimes husbands and wives end up ignoring each other. And then all of a sudden there's an empty nest. The children are grown and gone. And we look at each other and say, and who are you? And they look back and say, I don't know. Who are you? Where'd you come from? And we just don't know each other because we ignored each other all those years and we are virtual strangers in the marriage and in the relationship. Now, kids are important. We love them. We want to care for them. But guys, let me tell you this. As married men and women, we need to recognize the priorities that God has ordained. Now, first of all, first place love needs to be for the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The Bible says that, amen? Love God first. Second level of priority love is for your spouse. Does that mean I should love my husband or wife more than I love my children? Yes. And some of you are going, oh, no, no, no. Yes. Because you were there before the kids came along. And guess what? When the kids are grown and gone, you're still going to be there with each other. And so there needs to be that commitment to each other and you need to work on that relationship as much as you can. That's why it's so important to keep the focus on romance. Keep the focus on the marriage because someday you guys are going to be in that nest by yourself, husband and wife. No kiddos around. You're going to be there together. And you need to be in love as much as ever. So how do we do that, Pastor? Well, this is how I'll do it. It's not a magical formula. It's not a magic bullet. But here's what I do. Number one, we have a date night. We really do. Usually it's on Friday night. Sometimes we'll go out and eat. Sometimes we'll go see a movie. Sometimes we'll go to Walmart and buy socks. It doesn't matter. We just, do it. we just do it together. And that's a date night. You need to have a date night in your life. Also, you need to invest some good time and energy in your relationship as a couple. Don't put it all in the children. They deserve a lot of it. They require a lot of it. But you also need to put some good time and energy in your relationship. Here's one that I like also. Say, I love you at least once a day. That's not too hard. Once a day. That's all I'm asking. Just say, I love you. And don't say it like this. I love you. I mean, really say it. I love you, sugar babe. 